I'm going to talk about uh, sparse modeling. I think some of the previous speakers have talked a little bit about it, maybe a slide or two. And definitely, there was there's some overlap in, with this talk with what was just before, um, with Stephen Wright's talk. Um, but hopefully, hopefully some of it is uh, new, and so, you know you'll get something out of it. Um, so, okay, so. We're going to start out with saying why 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 do sparse modeling? Because it's it's pretty ubiquitous now. There's there's I think if you, you know, look at the NIPS 2011 and, and kind of control F sparse on the list of papers, then you'll find, I don't know, 20% or some ungodly number, um, mention sparsity. And and, you know, it would be nice to know. I mean, the, the first thing is is why 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 do we do this? Um, and I'm going to start the talk by quickly answering, and the answer will be boring, it because it kind of works for stuff. Um, and then we'll say what it is and, and how it works, and then we'll go back to the question of why again, because really, um, really there's, a, there's, a, there's a big empty question mark in the why. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll get to talk about that some. So let me start with the, the advertising why, or the brochure why. So why do sparse modeling? Well, because it works. Um, as of right now, in classical image processing, most of the kind of classical image processing tasks have state-of-the-art algorithms that are, uh, have sparse modeling as a major component. So especially image denoising and in-painting. Um, super resolution, when you're talking about small super resolution, like 1 to 2 or 1 to 4 or something like that. Um, sparse modeling is an important part of one of the really good um, object recognition um, machines. It's not in every one, but it's in a lot of them, and uh, it's important there. Um, you can get really good, just plain supervised learning results using sparse modeling. Um, and in, in, in a kind of different way, um, you, can, you can use sparse modeling as a way of building gigantic graphs, for example. There's a, there's a lot of other there's a lot of other things, but here's just a smattering of reasons why. And the reasons why are all, well, because it seems to be working for something. Um, so I didn't say what it is. Many of you probably already know what it is. Um, the what is someone gives you some points. So throughout this talk, we'll have um, endpoints in d dimensions, and they'll be written as columns. They'll be written as a column matrix. And uh, what we're going to do is take x and write it as the product of two things. We're going to write it as a product of a matrix w, which we'll call the dictionary, and a matrix z, which is the coefficients. Uh, w will be d by k, and z is k by n. k is usually, in this world, bigger than uh, d, but maybe smaller than n. n is usually quite large. Um, and the idea is we want to write x as a product of two things, but we don't want the two things to be stupid. We, we, I mean, it's trivial to write um, w as the identity and z as x, and you're done. But of course, we would like something slightly more intelligent than that. So we're going to choose this notion of close in a very boring way. We'll just use Frobenius norm. Um, but we'll also choose conditions on z that are slightly less boring to make this, um, to make this description of x interesting. And what I mean interesting mean parsimonious. We want to kind of write x in a way that uh, keeps as little information as, as possible, but all the information we want. Um, so that basic setup covers a lot of territory. Uh, the, basic ter the, the basic setup of writing a matrix X as a product of two matrices, and we're going to impose some parsimony on the columns of, of Z, say, covers a lot of territory. If we restrict um, K, if we make K small, and again, K was the number of atoms in the dictionary, or the size, the, the number of rows in the, the coefficients. If we restrict k, this is somehow the simplest kind of parsimony you can imagine, you just get uh, principal components analysis back. right? So again, we're measuring uh, wz minus x in Frobenius norm, um, and we're restricting the number of columns of um, w to k and the number of rows of um, z to k. So you, get, you just get the SVD back. If we say zij has to just be 1 or 0, then you get k-means back. Um, and actually, the, these two bullets 
together have been known for quite a long time. It's been, there's, I mean, recently, more recently, there were, there were papers saying it, but, but for quite a long time, for many, many, many years, um, it's been known that SVD and PC are, are somehow very related. Um, everything in between, <laughs> meaning if you, if you look at this one, this is the sparsest possible representation you could possibly get. In other words, for each column of Z, there's only one non-zero entry. Um, if you kind of go somewhere in the middle and you say, well, we want, um, we want perhaps um, only Q non-zeros per column of Z, not necessarily just one, where Q is somehow bigger than one, or something else, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, then you get, I guess, what's, sparse, what's called sparse modeling or sparse coding proper. And the idea is you're training both W and Z together. That's one of the important things here. In, in the first bullet, in PCA, a solution to W uh, gives, in closed form, a solution to Z. Um, and so in some sense, training one is equivalent to training the other. The same, in some sense, in this one, a, a clustering tells you what the mean is for each of the clusters if you're going to measure error in, in Frobenius' case. In these, it's slightly more complicated. Um, you really, training one does not, training one and the other together is, is, a, is a big deal. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I will say it may, not, it may not be obvious at first glance why this thing is related to this thing. And in some sense, I'm not going to talk too much about it in the talk, but the short answer is this is not a norm, and it's, it's somehow annoying maybe sometimes to deal with this. This is not a convex function if we fix w um, and try and solve for z. It's not a convex function. Um, this one, if we fix w and try and solve for z, this is a convex function. So some people like this one better. And the nice thing about this one here is this is the norm which is the closest to this. This is the thing which is a norm which is the closest to this thing here. Um, and it turns out that in many cases, it can be proved that if you have a solution to this guy, which is sparse, then you will have a solution to this guy, which is the same, which is sparse. Um, OK. So um, sometimes you want more than just sparsity on the columns of Z. Sometimes you want some additional structure. A very simple additional structure is you just have blocks of coefficients. And you say, oh, only one block of coefficient can be on at one time. That's a very simple, uh, that's a very simple example of what's called group sparsity. Um, group sparsity means that instead of penalizing the activation of some of the coefficients, in other words, saying, I'm only allowed to have a certain number of columns of Z on, you have a list of um, groups of columns of Z. And you penalize when th those groups are turned on. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk slightly more in the next slide about this one. It's a really simple model. So let's, let's look at this guy here. Let's look at, we have a bunch of non-overlapping groups of coefficients, and we're only allowed to have one group on at each, uh, for each x. Um, so this gives a really simple manifold model. So um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to talk about manifold in the uh, kind of continuous um, classical mathematical sense, but more in the data analysis sense, which means locally well approximated by affine sets. Um, so if you had a true manifold in the classical mathematical definition, then the tangent planes are the, the affine sets that locally approximate the manifold. But it might be impractical to work with that because, you know, if you have some continuous object, uh, having, a, having a local description at every single point is too much. You might just take some finite list of sub or of affine sets, so we say we have a budget. Uh, we, we know we have a ten-dimensional manifold. We have a budget of maybe fifty um, spaces, fifty uh, affine sets, and we'll try and find the best fifty uh, ten-dimensional sets. Um, best in the sense of every point on the manifold being as close as possible to one of those um, fifty sets. So. You might imagine that if your x isn't a very curvy thing, you can, you can actually do it well. Um, if you, whoops, if you, if you take that problem, I have some set of points, and I want to say, what is the list of uh, 50 planes that are as close as possible to my, um, to my set of points? 
you get a problem that looks like this. So that F there stands for Frobenius because we're measuring error in uh, mean square sense. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make all my, my, instead of affine, I'll say subspaces, just meaning I'll pass through the origin just for simplicity. Um, it looks slightly different, but uh, if, if you don't do that, so I, I just want to make this look like the original problem. So we're going to talk about someone gives me a set of data points, and I want to find a certain number of secant planes to those data points. I want to find, uh, in this case, um, let's see. How many did I say? L. I want to find L subspaces that are as close to my data as possible um, in the mean square sense. Um, and so what do you get? You get a problem that looks just like the one we had before, where you try and write your data x as a product of two things. Um, but the two things have a uh, block structure. Here you have the blocks of dictionary elements. And here you have the blocks of coefficients. And um, we've rearranged x. There is a permutation that's hidden there. Um, I should have written a permutation somewhere. But we rearranged x so that the x that are best represented by this dictionary, in other words, the x that are closest to the subspace um, spanned by w1 are here, and the x that are closest to the subspace spanned by w2 are here. Um, but once you do all that, your problem that you're trying to solve is simply this, um, wz minus x. Um, and subject to w having this block form and z having that block form. It's just, uh, this, is, this is called k subspaces. But what you can see is this is a manifold model. And actually, that's true in some sense for um, every sparse coding model. Um, if, you look at, if you look at all the kinds of models that we talked up to now, the L0 one, the L1 um, penalized one, all the group models, all of them have the property that the analysis map, in other words, if you take an input x and you try and find its best code, you get a piecewise linear map, or piecewise affine map for the L1 problem. The reconstruction map going back down to the data space from the coding space um, is linear. So what you have is a model of the data, which is piecewise linear, which you can think of. Again, it's not a, ma it's not a manifold in the, in the kind of classical continuous mathematical sense. But it is a manifold in the sense you're approximating your data by a bunch of locally affine pieces. Um, let's look at that a little bit more carefully for the L1 thing. So here, for a moment, let's pretend we fixed the, uh, we fixed the matrix W. We fixed the, the dictionary. And someone gives us a, we look at all the data points uh, x. And for each x, we find the mapping from x to z. So for each x, we find the z uh, minimizing the forward problem. So if w, is, is, if w has kind of the property that any subset of columns um, is full rank, then, uh, then z star is unique. And once you, you look at, once you look at the sign, in other words, the list of ones, zeros, and minus ones um, in the derivative and the subgradient here, then the solution is unique. Uh, let me say that uh, that was kind of an ugly way of saying it. So in other words, if you, if someone, if the enemy says, here's x, and I'm not only going to just give you x, I'm going to tell you what the, uh, in the true solution, what the um, positive entries of um, z are for that particular x what the negative entries of z are for that particular x, and what the zero entries of z are for that particular x, then you have an explicit solution for the minimizer of, uh, of this problem. right? So the explicit form of the solution is this thing here. So omega is the set of points, uh, is the set of coefficients of z that are non-zero. Um, and so what you have is that z is 0 outside of omega. And z restricted to omega is just um, w transpose w against x minus uh, lambda times the sine. Now, of course, this doesn't, this doesn't mean anything about actually solving the problem. This isn't, well, actually, we'll talk about that more in a second. You can't solve the problem for this because you, you needed to know the sign of this true solution in order to get this thing. But what it means is, within the, if you pick a particular x and it has this sign locally around that x, 
it will also have the same sign. And you have a mapping back. And that mapping is simply, uh, so you have this kind of affine mapping for all the points that have that same sign. So your total mapping from x to the x space to z space is piecewise linear, or piecewise affine. Um, there happen to be a very large number of pieces. So it's not obvious that this is a good way to think about it, because there's so many pieces. There's so many different choices of po possible sign choices. So it, it might be a strange way to think about it. But the point is, the mapping from x to z is piecewise affine. Um, OK, so a lot of people, I'm, I, I'm sure many of you have heard the words compressive sensing. Um, compressive sensing is something which is a lot like what we're, going to, what we're talking about here. Um, and it's a lot like it in the sense that the equations look the same. However, it is not actually a lot like it. <laughs> um, and this is, if, if you remember any slides from this talk, this is probably a good one to remember because many of the other slides are, are very common and you'll see them over and over. This is a slide which um, is, some, is, I think, very important and not often shown. <laughs> so what is compressive sensing? Compressive sensing is trying to do this. In other words, uh, someone gives you some data point z. And notice we flip the names. Before, I was saying my data points are going to be x. In compressive sensing, someone has given you some data point z. There is a code x. Okay, And what you, what you want to do is, from the code, recover the data. So compressing, compressive sensing happens when your machine cannot record data fast enough. So for example, you have a satellite which is, uh, which is taking images. And it needs to take images very fast. So it makes some sort of uh, quick random transformation of the data. That's the W. It makes a very fast encoding of the true data. And it outputs the X. Because the camera couldn't take pictures fast enough. So it had to, it had to, it had to just take less data when it was taking pictures. And then your job at, uh, later is to go and recover the data. And in compressive sensing, the, the matrix W is universal. It's supposed to work for any data um, Z, which is sparse. In sparse coding or sparse modeling, the relations are flipped. That's one major difference. And that's a really important difference. So the, uh, the minimum in the sparse coding, sorry, the uh, goal in the sparse coding thing is to get the code, which is Z. So here we're back to the, um, the notation we were using before. We have data x and code z. And our job is to get the code out. The z is the code. And now the second important difference is the w is adapted to the data. So the, w, the w isn't supposed to work for anything. The w is supposed to work for the particular x that you're studying. In other words, you have a set of x. And w is supposed to respect the properties of that set of x. So even though the equations of these two things are different, what actually, the way you actually do them is very different. And the, 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 uh, the, way, the way you should think about them is very different. Um, OK, so let's go on. So OK, so now we're going to get to the how. So that was the what. Um, so again, our job is to write x as a product of two things, w and z. Um, now I'm going to say, well, how do we, once we have w, once we've found w, how do we find z? So we're now into the how part of the talk. OK. So let's look at uh, this first, the L0 problem first. Um, we'll look at some greedy methods. So some of the, some of the more famous Greedy methods are matching pursuit and orthogonal matching pursuit. This uh, thing, order recursive matching pursuit, is somehow slightly less famous, even though a lot of people use it. Um, Cosamp is something new. Um, so these are, these, these are attempts to solve this problem. This problem is NP-hard. With w fixed, even finding z in this case is impossible. This is not a convex problem. You're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to minimize this over a, over a set which is really ugly. It's the set of unions of uh, subspaces. So you can't actually solve this for real, but you can make some greedy approximation to it, which actually, uh, which, which actually work pretty well in practice. Um, so let me describe 
one family of them, the uh, matching pursuit or orthogonal matching pursuit family. So what do you do? Again, we're right now having a fixed dictionary W and coefficient Z. Uh, fixed dictionary W, and given an X, we're trying to recover the coefficient Z. So um, in both orthogonal matching pursuit and matching pursuit, what do you do? You multiply the dictionary times the current residual. You initialize the residual as the whole thing. You find the uh, coefficient that has the largest inner product with the current residual. You add, that, uh, you add that dictionary atom to your active set. For matching pursuit, you um, take the, co the jth coefficient to just be the inner product with the current residual. For orthogonal matching pursuit, you do something slightly more expensive. You take your coefficients to be the best possible um, the best possible coefficients in the least square sense given the current active set. So here you just have to do one vector matrix, uh, one vector product to get the thing. Here you have to do matrix inversion plus a, a small matrix vector product. Um, that should be a little x, sorry. Um, and then you update the residual in both cases. What I did not write because it's slightly more complicated is ORMP, uh, sorry, um, yeah, ORMP. And there, instead of taking at each step the guy who has the biggest inner product, you find the guy who is going to give you the best answer after you do an OMP update. So it's a little bit more complicated to write down, but it turns out in practice it's not that much worse. So this is the um, matching pursuit and orthogonal matching pursuit argument, uh, algorithm. Um, so there's something very important about this, which is you don't have to do it in this way. This is, this is um, easy to write down, but it is hard for a computer to do. Um, when you actually run OMP or matching pursuit, you keep a few extra pieces of data in memory. You keep the gram matrix um, Q of W. In other words, you keep W transpose W in memory, and you keep this, you update this W transpose uh, W omega. In other words, you, you update the inverse of the gram matrix of the um, active set um, at each step with the Cholesky factorization. Um, and what that means is you can have a much faster algorithm when you have many, many inferences to do. In other words, when you have W fixed and you have to compute the Z for many different X's, you can do it much faster. Uh, once you store these things in memory. And you can even see it, if you, you can see it here. So here you just do a maximum over the current uh, t's. So what we do is we keep everything in the z space. You take a maximum, and this is, by the way, for uh, orthogonal matching pursuit. In fact, this is even simpler for matching pursuit. Um, it's slightly more complicated for the, um, for the ORMP. So you, you just have to take a maximum you update the, uh, this guy, you update the Cholesky factorization, and then all you have to do is do this multiplication. And if you look at each of these steps, um, what is nice is you only live in the small space. You live in a space which is the size of the number of coefficients that you currently have at each step. So uh, instead of like in the way the algorithm was written before, where each step you have to multiply w times the current residual, which is your entire dictionary times x, you only have to do multiplications that are size of the current active set. And then you have to take a max along the column, which is, which is quite a bit faster. Um, OK, so if you're going to actually code this, which I wouldn't suggest you do because people have done it and people have coded it very nicely, um, make sure you, make sure you, you do the optimizations because it will save you factors of 100. Um, OK. So when to use which of these methods? Um, in general, OMP is more accurate than OMP, which is much more accurate than matching pursuit. Um, they have exactly the opposite runtime. But let me make it clear that all of these are uh, very fast in terms of runtime. You shouldn't use matching pursuit because it's pretty bad, even though it's fast, unless you have to, because you, you, really, you really don't have any choice um, in terms of speed. Um, and if the problem is very large and you're only going to be doing it once, then you should use COSAMP, which we didn't talk about. It's a different algorithm. Um, in general, um, in most likely what you guys are going to be doing in machine learning it, at test time is many, many, many small 
sparse coding problems rather than one big one. So mostly you're going to be uh, over here. And so mostly, actually, you're going to be here because this one isn't much worse than that one. Um, so roughly, how long does it take to do an OMP? It takes roughly the time it takes for you to multiply your dictionary times the, um, times the uh, data once if you're looking for very sparse solutions. If you're not looking for very sparse solutions, in other words, if, if the Q that we talked about before is not small, you shouldn't be using a sparse method. So if you should, you shouldn't, sorry, I apologize, you shouldn't be using a greedy method. So if you're using a greedy method um, it, and, and you're doing it in the correct situation, it should be in the situation where you have very few non-zeros. Um, and then the computation time is roughly how much it costs to multiply the data times that, yes? How few is very few? How, how few is very few? So a constant, like 10. So if you're not working in the, in the realm of constant number of non-zeros, then the L1 methods are much more uh, reliable. Yes? Uh, do you think that parenthetical statements in the textbook Sorry? Uh, just explain a little bit about parenthetical Okay, yeah. So, so I said don't use matching pursuit. But there's some places where you just don't have enough time to do anything else. And you want to use you want to use a greedy sparse coding algorithm because it's the only thing you have time for. Because the greedy methods tend to be faster than the L1 methods. So some things you, ha you have no choice because matching pursuit is the fastest thing, at least in, in this. We'll talk about accelerating even further tomorrow. But if you're going to use kind of a classical method, matching pursuit is the fastest thing possible. And sometimes you don't have any choice. In convolutional problems, when you want to do uh, convolutional coding, you can't do an orthogonal matching pursuit really, because it requires, um, it, it requires solving. Um, you, have to, you have to keep those uh, gram matrices. And those are really ugly in convolutional problems. Um, so um, just, because, just because of the structure of convolutional problems, orthogonal matching pursuit is hard. You can do some other approximations, but it's, it's, we don't want to talk about it. Um, is that enough of an answer? Or? Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about the relaxed problem. Um, 4.30. Sorry? Oh, excellent. I have, what, when until 5? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the L1 problem. So for the relaxed problem, we have something. Okay, first of all, for the relaxed problem, there's been a huge amount of works. Um, so there are probably, um, it is not an exaggeration to say there, there are a thousand papers on how to do the L1 problem now. There, there's a tremendous number. There's no way I can discuss all of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about two that I think are good. And actually, one of them Stephen Wright has already talked about. So um, it should be, should be pretty good. So um, Lars is a homotopy method. And it makes use of a few slides back. We showed that once you know the active set for the L1 problem, once you know the active set, then you can explicitly write out the solution. So Lars makes use of this fact. Um, so how does the algorithm work? You, set, you start by uh, picking the active set as the guy with largest inner product with your x. And you start by picking lambda. Now remember, lambda was the regularization parameter. So let's look back at the problem, because this is slightly funny. Um, lambda is this lambda, which you've picked. It's a, it's a hyperparameter. But the, uh, the method is going to work by moving lambda until you get to the lambda you, you wanted to get to. So uh, sorry, let me, let me go one more time back to this. Sorry. Um, if lambda is huge, then the answer is 0, right? So just to, just to kind of test your sanity, if you want to minimize this error and lambda is, is gigantic, then it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good you do here. You might, as well just zero the, you, you might as well just take all the error here and zero this one out. So for a big enough lambda, you know the answer. You don't have to do anything. The answer is zero. Um, in fact, you can check what that lambda is that, that, that makes it zero. It's something like this. Um, it's, this. This is the lambda that zeroes everything out. So you start with that lambda. Um, and now what you do is you choose the next smallest lambda so that um, so that when you have, so this thing here, this z here is the true solution given the current active set, right? The current active set, the current active set is 0. Or sorry, the current active set is just the one guy that had the biggest inner product. 
So at each step, what you do is you find the true solution, given the current active set, which you have an explicit formula for, and you move lambda. And again, this true solution as a function of lambda is piecewise, uh, is piecewise affine. So you can just look at that piece, and you can actually just find the next lambda that's going to change something. So one of two things happens. Either A, um, either A somebody else, you've, you've lowered lambda enough that some other guy can come into the solution. Or for whatever reason, somebody get kicked out. But one way or the other, you lower lambda until something happens, one of these two things. And you either add one guy to the active set or take one guy out of the active set. Um, you do whatever needs to be done to the active set. And then given that active set, and this active set now also includes the information about the sign, you update the signs, you work on this thing again, you have the true solution, which is a function of lambda. You lower lambda, and you, you uh, repeat back and forth. Now that looks terrible. Um, in terms of speed. But it turns out the same tricks that we used in the OMP can be used here. And you can keep, uh, you can keep the gram matrix in memory, and you can keep kind of compact representations of everything that's there. Um, and this ends up being quite actually a good method for very sparse systems. OK, so ISTA, um, Stephen Wright talked about, um, it's, it looks quite a bit different, actually. Um, it's it's, it's um, proximal gradient descent is another name for ISTA. Um, and there's probably many more. Um, so you start, actually, you don't have to initialize Z at zero. You can initialize it whatever you want. But you take a gradient um, with respect to the smooth part of the, uh, you take a gradient with respect to the smooth part of the energy. Um, that's this bit here. Um, and now you take the output of that and you solve the what's called the proximal problem. In other words, you, you try and minimize the non-smooth part so that you're close to the smooth gradient step before. So you take a gradient step, and you end up in some location. Sorry, you take a gradient respect with just, the, just with respect to the smooth part. You end up somewhere. Now you try and find a uh, solution to just the non-smooth part, but that's close to the gradient step you just made. And you alternate with between those two things. So in the case of, uh, in the, case of the problem, in the case of this L1 problem, you have um, take a gradient step, then you take a shrinkage of that gradient step. Um, so here's, uh, here's, here's the shrinkage step. And you just um, iterate that until you feel like stopping, until something gets small enough. Um, as before, you can pre-compute things. You can pre-compute the gram matrix. It's not as important in this case, but I've done it just because I want to lead into the talk that I'm going to give tomorrow um, and because something cool happens. So what we're going to do is, as before, compute the gram matrix. right? Um, and we'll pre-compute b is equal to wtx. And now we'll just follow the ISTA algorithm. What happens? You take xk is just shrinkage of this linear mapping of z, of the current z, minus an offset. That should be a plus. Should that be a plus or a minus? OK, I'm, I'm blanking on that. That doesn't look exactly. I think that should be a plus. Anyway, I'm blanking on that right now, but uh, this is a little bit suspicious. Anyway, you have a linear map. It's either going to be plus or minus b, and then you shrink it. Um, that is a neural net, almost. If you had, if shrinkage was smooth, you would have a neural net. So I think Carol Greger was the first person who, who showed this to me, and it's actually pretty cool. So if you, you just look at ISTA, ISTA is like uh, operating a neural net with, uh, if you run k ISTA steps, it's like a um, k-level neural net with this is the weights, this is the offset, and the nonlinearity is a shrink, which is kind of cool. Um, OK, and as Stephen Ryan said, you don't usually do ISTA. In practice, you do the um, Nesterov um, accelerated version of it. And the Nesterov accelerated version of these things is just magic. Like I, I, it's, it's really weird. So it's, I spent a long time trying to understand. So what you do is it's, 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 instead of just gradient descent, you have gradient descent with a momentum term. So you go a little bit further in the direction you were going before, in the gradient direction you were going before. How much further do you go? Well, you have these weird weights that tell you how much further to go. And 
it's important that you get the weights right, actually. You can't just put anything here. It's not just any momentum term that'll work. There are other sequences that look slightly um, more simple than this one that also work. Um, but they, I, I can't really understand the meaning of them. And I've never seen a good geometrical explanation of the meaning. And when, I actually emailed Nesterov at some point, because I'd spent weeks just trying to, I just wanted to understand it. I didn't want it to be that formula. I wanted to know why it was. And he said it's just the thing that makes the calculation work out. So it's not clear that there is any, uh, any intuition known other than it's the thing that makes the calculation work out. So if you, by the calculation, I mean you can actually check the convergence rate of this. And if you want to, you, you, can, you can get a uh, faster convergence rate if you use exactly this update rule. OK. Um, so again, when to use what method? If you have many small, sparse problems, use Lars. Um, it's, it's really quite good. Um, it has a bad name because it looks bad. Um, and if you don't code it right, it's, it's bad. But if you code it with all the correct optimizations, it's actually very fast. But it's important that, it's very, that the output is very sparse. So if you're using large lambda, if the regularity is large and your problems are reasonably small, in other words, you're going to be storing the, uh, the gram matrix, and you're going to be doing many of those problems, Lars is the best. Um, if you have one big problem, then uh, FISTA, the accelerated Nesterov, is, is the best of the methods I know. And so there's lots of other methods, but these are the, of, of the ones I've seen, these are kind of, I think, the two that I end up using uh, for, the, for the L1 problem. Um, and by the way, th this Nesterov trick is actually really magic. It actually makes a huge difference, so you, you, should, really, you should really do it. Um, anyway, okay, so very quickly, when you when you want to learn the W. So what we talked about now is with W fixed, how do you get Z? Well, now we want to learn the whole system, W and Z together. Um, so how do you learn the W and Z together? Honestly, the best thing is just stochastic gradient descent. Um, just code an X, you get the Z out, take the gradient with respect to that X, move W a little bit, code the next X, repeat. Um, you can do somewhat better with an averaging stochastic gradient descent, but honestly, it's not that much better. Stochastic gradient descent works quite well for this. Um, honestly, the bottleneck is usually the update of the, um, the, the, the bottleneck is the update of the Z's, not the update of the W's. So um, yeah, it's not, it's not that bad. Once you've decided on a method for learning the Z, for, for doing the Ford, um, for, for getting the z's from the x and w, then just do stochastic gradient descent. Um, you can do batch methods. Sometimes it's useful. I'll give you probably an example tomorrow where it's useful to use a batch method. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting slightly short on time, so let me not talk too much about this. There are batch methods, but um, in some sense, it, it, it's, it's easier to just use stochastic gradient descent, and it's usually better. OK, so I said I'd go um, why, what, how, and then back to why. So I've done why, what, and how. Now let's go back to why. Um, so what do we know theoretically? And we know lots about compressive sensing. Um, that doesn't really answer the question of why we would want to use sparse modeling. But we do know lots about compressive sensing. Um, and so if your W matrix, and again, compressive sensing is, is, is really concerned with this forward problem. When can I recover the correct Z given an X? That's the, that's the fundamental question in compressive sensing. So if W is sufficiently regular, um, and so usually regular is defined by, for example, incoherency, um, and Z is sparse, then the greedy and L1 methods are guaranteed to recover the true Z. Um, regular is measured in this way. One of the ways, there's lots of ways that uh, W is measured. Oh, sorry, that regularity of W is measured. And usually it suffices to take a random W or Hadamard W, or depending on whether you need to make fast multiplications, there are lots of choices. Um, but unfortunately, none of that has anything to do with really sparse modeling. Because when you train the dictionary, it's going to be coherent. It's not going to satisfy the conditions that the uh, compressive sensing people want. And there's a, there's, a, there's a much more fundamental issue, which is in dictionary learning, we don't actually care about recovery, usually. Um, the, in, in the compressive sensing case, as shown in that slide back, the Z was the thing that was important. What you cared about, that was the actual data. What you cared about is getting the Z right. In sparse coding, the Z is just a proxy. It's a code. 
you care about uh, your reconstruction error. You don't care about your recovery error, usually. So you want z to make sense for some other task. But locally, within the sparse coding problem, you're training your things so that the reconstruction is good. And you don't actually care if you get the correct z as long as you get a z that gives you good reconstruction error. So not only the dictionaries are often coherent, so this doesn't exactly make sense. This doesn't work. You can't, use most, you can't use most of the theorems in compressed sensing. You don't actually, the thing that they care about, you don't actually care about. You don't care about recovery. So OK, it looks kind of similar, but not, uh, <laughs> not actually relevant to a lot of it. It's good. It's, it's useful to understand. But unfortunately, it doesn't answer the question of why we're doing this. So OK, what you really want is some theorems that say, when is this going to work? When am I going to actually get something useful out of training a dictionary? When am I going to actually get something useful out of this sort of matrix factorization? And the question is, what do we know about that? And the answer is, frankly, very little. We don't know anything about it. Um, so let me give a couple of examples, things that people know. So if you take lots and lots of data, um, which happens to be sampled IID from some, say, a Gaussian distribution on uh, an incoherent dictionary. In other words, uh, I simply take the code space, the sparse code space, and put uh, choose at random, uh, you know, ten entries to be non-zero, and then put a Gaussian weight, uh, put a Gaussian on each of those, um, and do this for every x, and then multiply each of those z's that I built to get each of the x's. So if I generate a data set in this way, then with high probability, the true solution for this problem is the, uh, is, the, is the dictionary. So what does it mean? It means that if I generate something from, a, from, from the sparse coding model, and I try and recover that model under some reasonably, uh, the, under some reasonably strong hypotheses, then you will get that dictionary back. And one of the uh, reasonably strong hypotheses, which unfortunately I didn't write here, which is very important, is that the dictionary that's used to generate the data has to be incoherent again, which again is something that you will not have in real life. So um, the second thing is all the theorems of this form, all the forms, the, the, this is called dictionary identification or dictionary recovery, um, all of these are for this constrained form of the problem. Um, in other words, the way you're going to the way you're going to find, you're going to find the dictionary that minimizes z1 over all the dictionaries that are possible. Um, again, this is the constraint problem, and the constraint problem is is very unrealistic as well. Almost always, there's some noise kicking you away from from kind of the ideal solution. So, this kind of the, the, these kinds of theorems um, are very interesting, but they only tell you about a case which is exceptionally not aligned with what happens. Um, they, they're for the constraint problem. They require that the, the dictionary that generates the data be incoherent. And they require very strong assumptions on the distribution of the, co of the, the z's. Yes? Um, the dictionary tells you how, the coherence tells you how well conditioned it is. So it tells you, let me go back to the definition. Um, it tells you, um, are two atoms in the dictionary almost the same? If two atoms in the dictionary are almost the same, then the dictionary is very coherent, right? Um, so what does it mean? So a dictionary being incoherent means it's very, very coherent. the Fourier basis. Fourier basis is very incoherent. Yes. So any orthogonal basis is the most incoherent you can possibly be. And in fact, then everything is easy. Um, in fact, sparse coding, the, all the sparse coding problems we had up to now have closed form solutions in, the, in, the, in, in those cases. Um, so the more incoherent, the easier any of these problems are, which doesn't surprise you. For example, if you look at the ISTA updates from before and the FISTA updates, um, the coherence of the matrix is exactly what tells you about the, uh, the um, conditioning. It tells you about the Lipschitz constant the size of the steps you can take. Um, so the point is, the more coherence, the faster everything works, the easier everything is. Um, 
but again, when you actually train a dictionary on data, it will often be, it will often be very coherent. And that's important, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a cluster. Suppose you have a, a cluster of, of data then it makes sense to put a lot of energy into covering that cluster well, because you'll, you'll pay a lot of L2 error if you, if you just put one point there. Right? You may consider this a flaw in dictionary learning, but all the models that we've shown up to now will do something like this. Um, OK, so again, these are, really, these, are, these are interesting theorems that say basically, these are, these are good theorems that say basically if you generate data according to this model, then you, the, the, the actual optimization of both things together recovers the, the model that you started with, which, or it's a local minimum. Actually, it only says, uh, then the true solution is actually only a local minimum. It doesn't even say that you actually recover the thing. But it's, a, it's, it's actually a really good start. Um, however, it doesn't explain why dictionary learning works at all. Um, the second set of theorems about dictionary learning, and really there are only two sets of theorems about, what, about, about kind of the theory of dictionary learning as opposed to compressed sensing. The second set of things are generalization bounds. Um, so what do generalization bounds look like? So if I define, uh, if I look at, so here I'm going to define zxw to be the thing that minimizes the, um, the, 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 the thing that minimizes the um, L2 error with a L1 norm fixed. Okay? Um, and now I have some measure out in space. I have some measure mu, which is a measure on, uh, uh, so this measure mu is a measure on RD. And I generate a bunch of points. Now, this is any, this is any measure. Um, then, and if we take the minimizer of the dictionary learning problem on the training set, and we look at the minimizer of the dictionary learning problem over the true distribution, right? And we define b to be the value of this expression. Then what you can say is that the test error using the uh, learned dictionary on the training data has this representation error. In other words, it has the best possible representation error plus something that depends like um, something that has something that depends like O root log m. Sorry, O one over log m. Um, notice there's a k here. Um, there's various forms of this. I, I, writ, I wrote one. There's another. There's another form of this that doesn't have a log m here, but has a k squared here. There's lots of other forms. So this version is from that paper. There's a bunch of different forms of this from this paper that, uh, that have slightly different characteristics, but you always get a root m. You might get different kinds of, you might get different kinds of things here. Um, what that says is if I train uh, my, if someone gives me some data and I train a dictionary on that data, and that data came from a distribution, then I can be reasonably sure that um, when I get new data, that I can represent it essentially as well as I represented the old data. That's actually a nice thing to know. But again, it does not answer the question, why should dictionary learning work? It's just saying that if it would work on your training data, then it will work on the test data to some extent. But it's not asking, uh, answering the question, when should this work? And the problem is, there, nobody really knows why, why, when it should work or why it should work. All the theorems that were described talk about when is it that the model can be successfully, uh, sorry, all of the, um, apologize. They say when can we use the model successfully? In other words, if I train on this, what will I get back? But nothing tells you when should I use it. What kinds of data does it make sense to use the sparse coding model on? And that's absolutely fundamental if you want to understand why the thing is working. You need to understand when it makes sense to work. Um, so what would a theorem, what would a theorem about, uh, what would a theorem about sparse coding look like? What would you want to get that answers this kind of question? So what you would want to do is look at some set of data points and extract some geometric type statistics or some other kinds of statistics or just some information from that data set that, that doesn't actually require you to go to test set. Just some geometric information about the data. And from that geometric information, be able to estimate the parameters that give you the best um, test error, for example, for, for, for the distribution that generated that data. And 
if you know that you're going to get a good test error, then maybe the thing is reasonable, for example. Um, but even in simple cases, there's no such thing. And by the way, you should be warned, if you want to think about this, that even for certain kinds of questions of this form, you know, the answer is unknown in k-means, which is a very simple form of this. So you should be slightly warned. So um, let's see. I have five minutes. OK, actually, I'll just stop. Um, let me, because, yeah, so I'll stop now. And